Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. We give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're in the Springfield, Clark County area, or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make St. John your new church home. This being the celebration of the Lord's Supper, your entire service is in your bulletin, except for the hymns. So you'll only need the red hymnal for the singing of the hymns. Everything else is in your bulletin. Uh, the one difference between this service and 8 o'clock is that we will not be singing hymn 853 uh, that you see on the hymn board. Uh, we do that at 8 o'clock because we don't have a choir to sing for it. So uh, instead of when morning guilt disguise, the choir will sing at that point uh, the anthem for today. So I would ask that you turn to page 2 in your worship bulletin. And I invite those who can without difficulty to please stay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are happy to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in love or in deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. So that we delight on your neighborhood and all neighborhoods to the glory of your holy name. Amen. St. John's Lutheran Church is thank you for watching us on YouTube. This is September the 7th and 13th Sunday after Pentecost. Our theme is Enliven and Preserve Your Church. Our first hymn was written by John of Damascus, a very old hymn written 696 through 754. That's when he lived at some time. He wrote that hymn. It's been translated by Jan John Mason Neal, but it's just as effective today as it was back in the year 600, the day of resurrection on the earth. Christ rose from the dead, and we are here to receive eternal life. As he came down as the bread of heaven, when we receive it in Holy Communion, he promises us eternal life.
Sunday after Pentecost, Phyllis Johnson will be reading the, re the gospel readings today. She's reading the scriptures. Our first lesson this morning is from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, beginning with the 7th verse. So you were, I have made a sentence for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity. But the blood, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you mortal, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 
this academic year. Um, if you did not attend the rally day, we'd like to invite you to join us for Sunday school. There are now two adult classes, the parables class, which has uh, been continuous, and I have already started the Alpha and Omega class. And parables is studying Genesis, and the Alpha and Omega class we are studying the first epistle of St. John. Uh, so we invite you to join us next Sunday at 9.15 uh, in the fellowship hall for the opening and then 9.30 classes begin. Thanks to everyone who once again who helped with our annual summer community drive-in service. Of course, last Sunday uh, being Labor Day weekend was the last Sunday. Unfortunately, it rained cats and dogs, so we didn't have any cats and dogs for the pet blessing. Most of the people stayed home. So. But there were a few great ones. Uh, again, my thanks to everyone who helped and everyone who supported it uh, throughout the summer. Young people are going putt putt this afternoon, or immediately after church. It's fun this afternoon. So uh, gather with uh, Nancy Lewis and enjoy putt putt today as the youth group. And all the other announcements, pretty well self explanatory as they appear in the bulletin, including next Sunday on the front row. Parks, the choir director is leading the choir in the anthem, and Pastor Pollock is joining to sing the anthem with them. September the 7th, the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. So it's out there from Springfield, Ohio. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When danger approaches, we want to warn it. We spend a lot of money in our society to have early warning systems to tell us about a tornado coming or a hurricane or a flash flood. The television and radio stations spend a lot of money on radars and new fancy technology so they can be the first to let you know when severe weather is coming. And of course, militarily, we spend millions of dollars for an early warning system. 
to let us know and be prepared if an enemy would launch missiles or be sending aircraft over to try to do us harm. But where those are something we deal with daily, we oftentimes forget there is another warning that we need. And that is the spiritual warning. We need to be warned and we need to be reminded of the danger of sin in our lives. And the danger of not having that promise of forgiveness and eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, as we live in this 21st century, we hear more and more people saying to us in the church, why do you have to always complain about the way society is? Why do you always have to criticize society? Why do you have to tell us that this action or that action is contrary to God's will? Why do you think that your morals or your ethics are the only ones that we should live by? Why don't you just live and let live? If people want to be Christian, fine. If they don't want to be, why do you constantly try to bring them into the church? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. The reason we constantly seek out those who are in church the reason we constantly seek out those who are backslidden, the reason we seek out those who believe that there is no God, is because we have been placed as watchmen for society. We have been given marching orders by our Lord Jesus Christ. And those marching orders tell us that we are to go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and to teach them all that He has commanded us. In our first reading from the, for today, from the 33rd chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel, we have a foreshadowing of the Ezekiel of our responsibility as individual Christians. Ezekiel was a prophet who began his prophetic ministry in the latter days of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Like Jeremiah, he was sent by God to the southern kingdom of Judah to tell them that they must repent and change their ways or God was going to unleash Nebuchadnezzar in the Babylonian empire upon Judah and his people. And so Jeremiah and Ezekiel put forth that message of the need to repent to turn back to God, to stop walking down the crooked path, the path of evil, the path of unrighteousness. But the people would not listen. They thought, as I told you last week with the passage from Jeremiah, they believed that as long as the temple stood, because they were God's chosen people, because they had this covenant with God, as long as the temple was there and they observed those festivals in the temple, then they were safe. Jeremiah and Ezekiel tried to tell them the temple of the Lord would do them no good if they did not change their hearts, change their mind, change their way of living. And they didn't listen. So in 586 B.C., Jerusalem fell. Nebuchadnezzar tore down the walls, destroyed the temple, and carried many of the Jewish people into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah escaped and went to Egypt where he wrote the book of Lamentation. Ezekiel, unfortunately, was caught and carried off to exile. As we read this 33rd chapter, this is written by Ezekiel while in exile in Babylon. And God once again comes to him with a message and with a commission with a responsibility that is the same commission and the same responsibility that you as a follower of Jesus Christ have in your everyday life. So let us turn back to the 33rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel and let us begin by looking at verse 7. In the 7th verse, God says to Ezekiel, so you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. I have made you a watchman. The word have made, or uh, how it's translated in the revised, new revised, 
provides on the back of your bulletin. Uh, the Hebrew means to appoint someone to something, to give them a charge. It means to bestow upon them a certain responsibility or to assign them something. What is it he's being assigned to be a watchman? The Hebrew word watchman literally means one who peers in the distance. That is what a watchman does on the city wall. He would peer into the distance to see if an enemy were coming. He would take in uh, everything around him. Not only would he peer in the distance, but he would be aware of everything around him. And he would observe the activities outside of the wall. So that if something was coming, he could sound the wall. Well, Ezekiel is being called now by God to be this watchman to the people of Judah, to the Jewish people, to tell them that he has a new message for them. And that Ezekiel is to give this message to them. Therefore you shall hear my, my word from my mouth and warn them for me. My mouth literally means as a Hebrew word that literally, literally, literally <laughs> means divine revelation. God is giving to Ezekiel a divine revelation. God gave the world a divine revelation on that first Christmas when he sent his son born of a woman into the world to reveal God totally and completely as the word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and and so just as Ezekiel is receiving this divine revelation from God, we receive the divine revelation through Jesus Christ. And just as he is to warn his people, we are to warn those that we come in contact with. We are to warn our brothers and sisters, warn our neighbors, warn those we work with, warn any we come in contact with who are not followers of Jesus Christ. As it's been said, those on the road to heaven will not be content to go there by themselves. When you believe in Jesus Christ, when you have that peace in your heart that passes all understanding, when you have that joy of knowing that your sins are forgiven, no matter how severe they may be, when you have that assurance of forgiveness and that promise of everlasting life, that the burden of religion has been lifted off of you, that your salvation comes not by you doing works, but comes through grace, through faith in Jesus Christ, you should want to share that with others. That's what the early church did. This very small group ended up spreading throughout the entire Roman Empire and beyond. Because those people wanted to take people with them into heaven. They wanted others to share in that wonderful news. Salvation by grace through faith. Apart from works of the law. And so we have that same marching orders. And we should have that same attitude. We want to share it with others. As one person said, the greatest thing that they will experience in heaven. Or the greatest thing they could experience was not just being reunited with family and friends who had gone before them, but that the greatest thing would be that somebody he doesn't even recognize would come up to him or her and say, because of you, I am here. Because you took the time to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with me, and I accepted God's gift of grace, I am now in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. Just like you. And that should be our goal. That when we get to heaven, it's not just being reunited with our family and friends, but to have someone or someones come up to us and say, It's because of you that I am. Because you took that time. So that's how the early church grew. They grew by inviting people to come with them. Come and see. Come and hear. Come and listen. Listen to the good news that we have heard. And so just as God is telling Ezekiel, now you are going to be the one who gives warnings to my people, the warnings of wickedness and evil for them to repent, we as followers of Jesus Christ have been given our marching orders by Jesus Christ and are to be that same watchman giving warning to society. Warn them of the wickedness. And this 
is the reason why in verse 8. When I say to the wicked, and here the word wicked means those who are morally wrong, those who are unrighteous, those who are godless, those who are lawless. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. He's saying, there's a wicked person, and you know that, but you don't share the good news with them. You don't share that divine revelation of Jesus Christ with them. Then they will suffer because of the life they lived, what they did, but their blood will be on you. Because you had the opportunity to share the good news of the gospel with them, and you would not do it. Whether it's because you're intimidated by society or whatever reason. God is putting the ball squarely in our court. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called upon to call society to repentance. Not to say we're better than you because we have been forgiven. Not to say we know what's right and wrong every, in every instance. But calling society to repent in the name of Jesus Christ. To come to Jesus Christ. Come to that mercy seat, to come to that cross, to receive that cleansing that only the blood of Jesus Christ can give us. So when someone says, why are you Christians always have to try to tell society to repent and to come to Jesus, the reason is because we don't want your blood on our hands. Because God has said, one day there will be a record. As Jesus promised, one day he will come again. And it won't be in humility like the first time. It won't be coming as a little baby, born of a woman, and placed in a man. But instead, as he tells us in the Gospel of Matthew, the trumpet will sound, the heavens will open, the angels will descend. And then will come the Son of God, the Son of Man, in all of his glory. To bring about the final judgment. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, there is no judgment. We've already been assured of eternal life in the kingdom of God forever. <clears throat> but for those who tried to earn their own salvation, for those who thought they didn't need Jesus Christ, for those who denied the existence of God, then they will receive the sentence that they chose. You often hear people say, well, if God is a loving God, no one's going to go to hell. Because why would God, if he's loved, send anybody to hell? And as we read in, from Ezekiel here, and as we read from the epistles and from Jesus' own words, God won't be sending anybody to hell. You choose to go. He gives you a choice. Life in Jesus Christ. Or death by trying to earn it or by denying him his existence, thinking you don't need him. So people who reject the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ have chosen their destiny. And that is why we have been called to give them warning, why we have been called to be watching for society. To let them know this is real. Eternity is a long, long time. It never ends. It'd be much better to be in that kingdom of heaven and that mansion prepared for you by Jesus Christ Himself to be sitting down at that banquet feast that has no end than to be suffering the torments of hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and where there is no end to the suffering. So, this is why it is up to us to give that warning to society. He then says in verse 9, Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, if they do not turn from their ways, they shall die in their iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. So again, you make the choice. You share the good news with somebody, they reject it. They suffer the consequences of their decision. I've had people that I have tried to share the gospel with, they reject And I have to admit that being a person
personality I am. It hurt. It stung. They didn't listen. But they made the choice. They walked away. I did not know. And that's what we're all called. One famous preacher said, quote, it is the job of the pastor or the preacher to fill the pulpit. It's the job of the members to fill the pews. So we all have to share that good news. We all have to invite someone who is unchurched, someone who is backslidden, someone who claims that there is no God. It is up to us to invite them to come to the cross, to come to salvation. The death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection and ascension. But God doesn't wish anyone to be condemned. That's why he makes salvation so easy. In verse 11, we read, God saying to Ezekiel, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their evil ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? So Ezekiel is to give this message to the exiles that they need to turn from their wickedness that calls them to be exiled, that calls them to be taken to this foreign land where they hung up their harps in the trees and wept us on the banks of the rivers of Babylon. He's telling them now to repent. St. Peter echoes a similar idea in his second letter, when in the third chapter, the ninth verse, after he has reminded us that to the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, St. Peter then writes in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not only that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Here we hear this message again. That the Lord is not slow. He does not delay. He is not lingering. He's not late concerning his promise of salvation as we look at slowness or being delayed and so forth. But he's long suffering. The word usually is translated in your more modern translation as patience. The King James and the New King James use that whole literal translation of the Greek word long suffering. See, God is patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, that he does not desire any to be destroyed. He is not sitting by just waiting to zap us. He wants us to be part of his eternal kingdom. He wants us to enjoy everlasting life. It comes through faith in Jesus. That comes through faith and believing that Jesus' death upon the cross pays the debt of sin that you owe. That he has atoned for your sins. He has redeemed you. He has brought you back from sin, death, and the power of the devil. On the third day, he rose again. Forty days later, ascended into heaven. But believing that, we are forgiven. And we have that promise of everlasting life. So it is our responsibility it is our responsibility to be the watchman of society. It is our responsibility, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, to be that city shining on a hill that cannot be hidden. To be that light in a dark room that illuminates the darkness. To be that bit of yeast that is placed in the dough that enables a whole dough to rise. It's been bestowed upon us. It has been committed to us to give that warning to society the need to repent. The need to repent in the name of Jesus Christ and be assured of forgiveness and the promise of everlasting life. So we spend a lot of money on warning systems to warn us about bad weather. We spend a lot of money on military systems to warn us of an enemy trying to launch a surprise attack. But well, we need to spend
spend a lot of time sharing the good news of the gospel with others. The church has to go into the world because the world is not going to come into the church. Contrary to what somebody said to me many years ago in my early days as a pastor, when talking about evangelism, they said, well, pastor, the times are out on the sign and the door is open. If somebody wants to come to church, they can come in. You know as well as I do. Very few people are going to walk into a church just on a whim. The very few people are going to walk into a church because they feel that need of forgiveness or they're looking for something. But you invite them and they will come in. You invite them. Expose them to the Word of God. Expose them to the power of the Holy Spirit, calling them to the Gospel. And you will be surprised at the results. So it is our duty. It is our assignment. It is our commission. It is bestowed upon us that we are the watch people of society. That we give the warning so that all may come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We will now sing the old word of God incarnate, hymn number 514, in the back of your red worship. Hymn number 514. This hymn was written by William Howe. He's an Anglican writer, written in 1864. He helped the poor. He was a bishop, but he refused to ride in the official bishop's uh, carriage. So he was called the Omnibus Bishop because he took public transportation. He worked among the poor, wrote many, many hymns. This is one of his hymns, a beloved hymn, 1864. William Howe, he was from um, Durham, England, he graduated from law school in Oxford, and then he finished the seminary as an Anglican bishop.
We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. to come forward. The acolyte brings the <coughs> offering plate. Those helping with service today, Becky Dimitroff, worship assistant, Phyllis Johnson is the reader, Marcella Johnson and Becky Dimitroff are the communion assistants, Gina Pollock and Connie Singleton are the ushers. Flowers today are presented by Linda Fox and her husband Dwight in honor of the 30th wedding anniversary and also bulletin thanks Helen Wallace and Linda Fox for making aprons for the members of the school staff. We're happy to have you worship here. You can take virtual communion. And we know that if you could be here, you would. Since you're not here, we'd love to have you. But if you're here in spirit, you're watching this, it's a virtual communion. Jesus is bread who came down from heaven. He promised that if we eat his body and drink his blood, we receive eternal life. He was resurrected after the third day. He spent 40 days with the disciples and apostles. He did teach them. We have the opportunity now, his arms are outlifted, to accept his offer. How can we refuse it? Eternal life, love, being with those we love in heaven. All of heaven is eternity. We can receive it. The living bread has come down from heaven and can be with us always until the end of the world. We now see the members of the assistants, the chief pastor, getting ready, preparing the Holy Communion. Then you receive the uh, benefits of listening to us prepare 
the Holy Communion as we believe that Jesus is the living body. He has said he will be with us until the end of the world, that he is the living bread come down from heaven. He says he is the bread and the body. We will receive it today.
and be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your sins. To you, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Holy time when we receive the living bread come down from heaven. Jesus has blessed us, it's a part of us. We're one in Him, one body. We are one blood. We are one in Him now, and we have eternal life. Watch the members of the congregation as they have received Holy Communion and been very blessed by this act that Jesus 
commanded us to do, shared with us. It's a wonderful <coughs> offer, and we have received it today. by Francis Haverdow in uh, 1877. She was a famous hymn writer, one of the most popular hymn writers in England, also she's very popular in the United States. Her father was a hymn writer, she was a poet. Francis Haverdow, she's from England, Worcestershire, Worcestershire.
thanks for watching St. John's on YouTube. You can watch it at any time. We're happy to bring you this service on Sunday. We offer a fish and school program ages 3, 4, nursery, and pre-K. For more information, call 325-4311. 425-4311. Tune in again anytime. Thank you for joining our worship this Lord's Day. We hope and pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you all these days. We pray for you. Continue to pray for us on YouTube ministry. Remember, repent, love God, love one another, confess your sins, come receive Holy Communion, receive eternal life.